minimizing charisma, maximizing intelligence, shooting someone in the crotch with a cannonball, thrust, propulsion, it's sciency. <laughs> Why you always gotta be blowing my spot up like that? There are my runes. There they are. I'm not mad. Science needs art and art needs science. They both need each other to function properly. There are ways to figure out what the paper is really saying. And then I'm ready to get on Twitter and yell at people about doing their own research on the oh! oh, hold on there, sports fan. Kyle Hill, everybody, is the next generation of science communicator. I'm going to be too old at a certain point to do those terrible things to my body, and it'll be up to you. He's got like a lion's man. This guy's amazing. <laughs> Kyle Hill. I'm Boo Rambo. The universe is indifferent to you. Whether or not you have amazing hair, the universe doesn't care. How are trees pushing past this pressure limit? Ah! Behold, my balls. Ah! <laughs> now we're getting somewhere, but I still don't think it's worthy of G.R.R. Martin suspender. I'm totally right, right? Oops up photos of my my frickin' hair? Is that what you all want? No, you don't, weirdos. Kyle Hill. Is your last name actually Hemsworth? What's going on? Our, our resident Thor no. lookalike. I prefer uh, Black Friday Chris Hemsworth. Oh, thank you. Hey, you know, if you need a haircut. No, of course not. We're not going to send sharks with frickin' laser beams on their heads to an asteroid. We're going to nuke it. You don't need Bruce Willis at all. <laughs> Wrenched. Oh! oh. Headshot! Oh! Kevin, turn on the monitor. Kevin, this transition better work. The blast doors can't. Kevin, turn it on. Ke Kevin. And Kevin, call his agent and have them call my agent. Kyle Hill. Happy birthday. Feliz Navidad. I'm just a biologist. I don't know how this works. This is how you do science. Can I just grab it? Oh. Laws. Corollaries. <laughs> I know that global catastrophe isn't the most fun thing to think about all day unless you're me, so... Are we gonna do some science, bro? <laughs> Lasers don't have that much momentum. That's not how a clockwise works. <laughs> don't worry, you can do this even if you are not an AI. It points the boundary layer around a person to identify. And I guess it matters what kind of dragon we're talking to realize here is that the bigger the thing does this kite is completely inaccurate. I'm gonna kill this guy and tell him to his face. You're wrong about physics. Not enough lift force. Oh. Nuclear metal donut thing with magnetically confined star-like plasma. The radiation flux in here alone is enough to cause instant death. That's really funny. I like that idea. Hey, look at me. I'm a streamer. I have a bedroom. We know anything with a decapitation hazard deserves to, uh, yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, oh that's good. Oh. That's fine. Put it on PBS. I dare you. Yeah. No, no, no. No, I wouldn't say it was the full introduction, but it's, it's, it's pretty, it, yeah, no, no, it keeps getting long. What's that? Yeah, no, about $125,000. Why? Well, <laughs> I mean, you can see the quality. We're not Ludwig over here. Hmm. Yeah. No, 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 Creator Clash, I can't risk my face getting punched in. Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, million bucks? Maybe a million bucks? No, I'm not gonna meet you in the parking lot with a bag full of... Well... What? <laughs> no, they're not. Then they would have to be in my office right now. I'll be right back. See you at dinner. Love you, bye. Chat! Welcome! Welcome to my office, of course. Kevin, turn the music down. Jeez. Stupid kids. Oh, hello. Welcome to the office of the administrator. Welcome back to the triumphant return once again of office hours. Chad, we have something to talk about today and it has to do with anti-gravity and anti-matter. I was slightly late today and uh, the intro was slightly longer today because I was literally reading the study up until about three seconds ago and making sure I understand it. Um, but what cow, I can't, don't you understand everything? No, 
But I understand most things because, hello, welcome to the facility. I'm the administrator, as you can see here on Coruscant, Kyle Hill. Our job here at the facility is to explore, explain, educate, and entertain, dip, dive, duck, and dodge dip. I hope you join me here, just like all of my facility members do at patreon.com slash Kyle Hill, videos early, private live streams, all that good stuff. And if you want to continue, as we as we discuss the antimatter news today, if you really, really, really want to get in touch with me, not only can you go to the Patreon, get in the private discord, but you can also try Super Chat. Can't promise I'll get to all the Super Chats, but I'll try my very best. It all goes towards our nerdy mission. Like Liz Calvert with the 10. Uh, by Tiny Human Alex's question of the week. Hello, Alex. Why does lava cool into igneous rock so quickly? Um, not all lava cools super quickly, but when lava does cool super quick quickly, um, that's why it takes on a more like crystalline form because uh, it, it rapidly, rapidly solidifies. And that's either when it's coming into uh, very close, quick contact with a lot of water straight into the sea or it's being flung throughout the air during a volcanic eruption. That's when you get like volcanic glass. Uh, ES S Shaddy with the 1999 to be follically gifted to the falky gifted person from one who wasn't not fair share the wealth no what about pro matter no I'm not pro matter I'd rather be non-existent but chat you can always try super chat like I said it goes towards our nerdy mission of expanding the facility look look how many rooms we have now chat welcome it's been a little while. This touches on a number of things. Um, I'm not a physicist. I am an engineer and I do know a lot of physics, but this touches on a lot of things from physics to experimental engineering to even conspiracy theory weirdos. We'll get there. I haven't been on YouTube too much because of work and I was wondering if you did an episode in LK99. This is Tob Merkel with the 499. No, I have not. TM scientist, welcome. Chompy, thank you for moderating. Kyle is antimatter. No, if I was antimatter, um, hmm. so antimatter famously annihilates, of course, and we'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get into that. Um, but antimatter annihilation releases energy proportional to E equals MC squared. And because the speed of light squared is three times 10 to the eighth squared, that's a big numby. That's 10 to the 8th times 10 to the 8th, which is class 10 to the 16th, correct? So anything times 10 to the 16th is going to be big, right? So even a tiny bit of matter is going to have, release a tremendous amount of energy. If I was completely annihilated right now, I'm pretty sure um, it would be the end of the state that I'm in. Not just my physical state, but like the, the state in the United States. Uh, Matthew Walden with the 10. Keep nerdy, Kyle. As for antimatter, we need a reactor, says Matthew Walden. The fun thing about antimatter, and we'll get it, chat. I know you're excited to have me back, but just. Um, the cool thing about antimatter is theoretically, it is the most efficient fuel that there is. Um, in any kind of fuel making process, you lose energy at every step through friction and heat and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that happens with any engine, even an antimatter engine. But what's good about antimatter is that it's theoretically the most energy dense fuel. All of the all of the mass of it gets converted directly into energy, right? That doesn't happen with gasoline and fission and fusion. Where you been, Asgard? Maybe. Skynet Red with the five. Hey, Kyle, just want to say you change people's minds. Minds, let's go educated Psychi. I realized something driving home after I was buying liquid nitrogen today. Um, isn't it kind of weird that I want to like continue on like a, like a Bill Nye kind of legacy thing with my life and my name is Kyle Hill, Bill Nye, Hill Kai. What? So chat, 
We're talking about antimatter today and anti-gravity. Now, people have been uh, just uh, casually interested in anti-gravity for a long time. Why? Because it's cool. You get to float and stuff. It makes our sci-fi spaceships, it makes our alien UFOs that aren't real and have never been here float. It's very cool. It has the, the, the anti-gravity idea, therefore, has suffused a lot of media. Just don't become Neil deGrasse Tyson. No, I'll, I'll we'll always encourage you to be nerdy. Hill Kai, the science guy, exactly. Hill Guy, the science guy. Um, and so th this this kind of idea, because it goes against our internal physics of things, we, we know even from a very early age that if you throw something up, it comes down. And so th something that looks like it magically goes against that is very uh, persuasive and interesting, right? So persuasive and so interesting that people have been trying to make anti-gravity things for years. There's been many patents, there's a bunch of, uh, many patents in the olden days, older days, and now in modern times, like on YouTube, you can find dozens and dozens of videos who, of people who think they've invented anti-gravity. <laughs> now, I will say that up until this moment, well, actually the entire time. But we've we've kind of ruled out anti-gravity as a thing. It doesn't seem like there's some missing force that we're missing or something that we uh, or something that we could create that doesn't involve forces that we already fully understand. But one holdout of this has been antimatter. Now, I will I say hold out, but I want to preface all this by saying the scientists studying this and the and we'll go through the study because that's what we do here. We actually go through studies. We don't just say we read something. Who am I, Tim Pool? No, I have way more hair than him and he's stupid. Um, we will go through the study, but none of the scientists studying the connection between antimatter and anti-gravity thought there was a real chance of them being one producing the other. Okay. But there is an experimental void for that. A lot of times in science, a lot of times in science, the experiment lags behind the theory. Okay. So Einstein's theory of relativity, for example, is the most complete description of gravity that we have. And yet, it wasn't until just a few years ago, almost a hundred years after his first theories, that we detected gravitational waves. Why? Because we couldn't make a big enough tube with a, the least amount of air possible in it. It was too hard. And we had to wait in 1919 for a, a lunar eclipse to watch light bending around the moon to validate general relativity. So a lot of times it's an engineering problem, right? And so the, the possible connection between antimatter and anti-gravity has been an engineering problem that we needed to eventually finally conclude with or, or, or wrap up. So the connection I, I keep not saying it, is that if antimatter acts the opposite of matter, does it act opposite to the influence of gravity that all normal matter does? Antimatter, of course, just being normal matter, normal matter with the opposite charge. So instead of electrons with a negative charge, you have positrons, which are electrons with a positive charge. Instead of protons, you have antiprotons, which have a negative charge. And we'll be talking a little bit about that today. And when those two things combine, matter and antimatter, it annihilates, again, according to E equals MC squared in terms of its energy release. So the theory has been there that, okay, there's, there's this possible holdout here. Maybe antimatter 
anti-gravities because it, it is the opposite of everything else. But we didn't have the ability to experiment with it. Why? Because it's really freaking hard. Do you know how much equipment it takes? Do you know how hard it is to make antimatter? The thing about antimatter, when I first in, when I first mentioned this in the chat, is that well, of course, antimatter uh, goes down. It wants to touch something on the ground and annihilate. Well, no, 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 no. Antimatter, if it's like an anti-hydrogen or an anti-proton, it is literally going to react with anything, any matter, if it's like an anti-proton. So it can't touch the ground, it can't touch the experimental apparatus, it can't touch air, it can't touch another large atom, right? So it's, it's once you create antimatter, which is hard enough, it's so hard, it's, it's, it's not actually valued, but if you were to put a number on it, it's like trillions per gram. Physics Girl has a good video about that. Not only is it hard to create, it's hard to confine. You need incredibly precise magnetic fields to keep it, say an anti-proton or an anti-hydrogen, from touching anything. Because it wants to. Ooh, it wants to. It really wants to. So that's why we have Alpha here, the experiment that we're looking at, that used magnetic fields that they could and I said an incredible experiment, that they could manipulate on the part of one in 10,000 its field strength. So really, really um, precise magnetic field manipulation. Temperatures cooled, by uh, cooled down by liquid helium to just like half a Kelvin above absolute zero. And um, anti-hydrogen and they used anti-hydrogen because it's actually electrically neutral. Now, why is being electrically neutral very important? Well, gravity is the weakest force in the universe. Class, how many forces, fundamental forces are in the universe? You in the back. No, that's a stupid question. There are stupid questions. You, right, four, it's four. Strong and weak nuclear forces, electromagnetism, and gravity. Of these, gravity is by far the weakest. By order, many orders of magnitude, the weakest. If you don't believe me, just jump. Even your little meat legs can, can beat gravitational forces from a planet. This... These are two mag these are two magnets. Electromagnetic force. Electromagnetic forces also much much stronger than gravity. Okay? And so, you need an electrically neutral particle. Like let me just make sure I'm getting all of this right as I'm talking here. Cuz if I'm not then <laughs> Did use anti hydrogen, right? Oh, anti hydrogen. Now they used anti hydrogen specifically because it's a anti proton. So protons are positive. So anti proton is negative. And then positron, which an electron is usually negative, but a positron is positive. Those equal and opposite charges yields a hydrogen atom, anti-hydrogen atom that is electrically neutral. So now it's electrically neutral, which means it's not going to be influenced by electromagnetic fields in the same way. And now you have to confine it magnetically. And so this experiment is so difficult because they have to, I'll put it this way, they have to control everything so finely that the weakest force in the universe becomes apparent. So they're controlling for everything else in this experimental setup, just so they can see gravity acting alone. And because gravity is so weak, it's hard to do that. Okay. Okay. 
So let's get into specifically what we're talking about, the study itself. Boom. Okay, let's just get right into the study. We can, we can, we can, you and I can figure this out, surely. Observation of the effect on gravity and the motion of antimatter. Published in Nature, as we were talking about, um, 1919 solar eclipse, gravitational waves, the theory has passed many tests, but we didn't get to experiment on it yet. The gravitational force on a proton at the Earth's surface is equivalent to that from an electric field of about 10 to the negative 7. So you can see that the electric field is much, much stronger than gravity. The situation with magnetic fields is even more dire. A cryogenic antiproton at 10 degrees above absolute zero would experience gravity level forces in a magnetic field of negative 10 to the 10. Controlling stray fields to th this level to unmask gravity is daunting. So what did they do to address this dauntingness? They created this apparatus, the Alpha Apparatus. Now, this is a big tube, Chet. This is a big tube. Solenoid, magnets, penning trap with electrodes, magnetically confining antimatter in a, in a in a certain region so that it doesn't touch the sides of the apparatus and annihilate. Liquid helium flowing around all of this. That's what's keeping it so cool. You have the injection of antiprotons and positrons here, which create anti-hydrogen. And here in a close-up, here's the breakout of this. This is this writ large. You have basically these, these two red rectangles are, um, think of it like the top and bottom of this tube, magnetically. So there's no actual top and bottom, but it's a magnetic top and bottom. So you can see the field strength here. The field strength at the top and bottom is very high. So it's it's holding, once they create these protons, these the anti-hydrogen, they stack them up here with these other rectangles stack, 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 stack in a magnetic field. And then they keep them from escaping by putting a magnetic lid of higher field strength on the top and the bottom. Chad, are you still following me? Okay. So why do you do that? Remember, we're isolating variables. We need it to be super cold so that the thermal motion of these particles does not affect our results. We also need it to be super rigidly maintained electromagnetically, so no stray voltage from something or somewhere or magnetic field of the Earth is influencing our results. Okay. So once we have this magnetic trap set up, basically, we want to investigate the force of gravity right? The gravity itself. Now, being scientists, they didn't just look at normal gravity. They didn't just let it assume that it was, they didn't just assume that everything was under normal Earth's gravity. No, they used the magnets themselves to mimic the effect of gravity. So by having differing field strengths between these two points, the top the top and the bottom of the apparatus, you can mimic the gravitational acceleration or just the acceleration of particles on Earth's surface. They called that the magnetic bias. So here you can see different field strengths that they used to create effectively environments of plus and minus 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2, 3, even 10 G. Now when I say plus and minus, that means they're effectively changing the direction of gravity, right? So if if a normal anti-hydrogen particle experiences 1g gravitational acceleration, then negative 1g right here would mean that it's weightless. 
And in a 1G situation, I think they point this out. Yes. So in a one-dimensional model, just up and down, a magnetic bias, an anti-gravity bias of 1G in the opposite direction. Gravity's normally down, so we put a negative sign. Remember? Remember? From your class? Put a negative sign indicating op opposite direction. Magnetic bias of 1G to balance the downward force for hydrogen. And we, had, we would assume there that if there's no weirdness going on, that when the hydrogen is effectively weightless, when there's no gravity, an equal number of hydrogen, anti-hydrogen particles would float out of the top and float out of the bottom of the device. Okay, that's our starting point. They additionally went with plus and minus all these different G values. So when the gravity field is influenced by magnetism or, or uh, added to or subtracted from with these finely controlled magnets, which way will the hydrogen fall? Will it fall with the gravitational field, even if it's pointing up? Will it go against it, even if it's pointing down? That's what we are trying to find. We're talking about at like just a few dozen atoms in in magnetic stacks. The real the 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 fine tunedness of this is really incredible. So what did they find? This is called a histogram. So what did we say, chat? So this is the top of the apparatus, and this is the bottom of it, I think. Even because the negative G means the you know it's it's a little harder to think about so, but bottom of the device remember this thing this thing they're measuring these um mirrors there are mirrors here mirror coils see these these red ones this is where you measure what is annihilating you said oh one escaped at the top one escaped at the bottom you measure that from the annihilation events and if this is the bottom this is the top okay Bottom, top. Now from the bottom and the top, let's go to the magnetic bias of negative 1G. What did we say? What did we say, chat? If the magnetic bias is negative 1G, that means it counters out 1G, and it should be weightless in this field. And what do you see? An equal number of anti-hydrogen escaping from the bottom and escaping from the top, only under the influence well, under the influence of nothing. And under the influence of nothing, you'd expect the random motion of particles to be evenly distributed, 50-50. And, and indeed, that's what you see. Now, when we start having a positive bias, we start adding to the, to the gravitational field with magnetic fields. This is effectively like Goku training. Okay, we make the bias so that it's 1G, 2G, 3G, 10G. We see clearly most of the particles falling out of the bottom. And when you go against gravity, 2G, 3G, 4G, negative 10G, you would weigh so much less, so much less on this planet, it's crazy. When you see this, they follow the gravitational field, even if it's pointing up, even if, if it's at the top of the device. So by following the field strengths of these magnetic biases, it shows that the anti-hydrogen isn't doing something weird. These would be reversed if anti-matter had an anti-gravitational component to it, or, or acted in an anti-gravitational kind of way. Yeah, so this was really hard to do, chat. We've considered other effects could mimic a gravitational force or add significant uncertainty. We've early determined, uh, wait, wait, wait. A one voltage potential charge would have the same effect as a change in a magnetic field. 
Um, this is they're saying how hard this was. Okay. And again, according to theory, this doesn't surprise anyone. If you have the same mass, you have the same gravity. Three meter tall vertical shaft, superconducting electromagnetic coils under a vacuum. In an experimental milestone. So chat, let's sum up real quick. Antimatter may have had some anti-gravity bias. We didn't think so from theory, but we had yet to experiment with it. What we did is make a very complicated experiment that controlled for temperature and controlled for magnetic fields. Two much stronger forces in the universe, therefore only using gravity by itself, letting gravity do its thing. We then supplemented that gravity with magnetic fields to see even in differing gravitational fields, would the anti-hydrogen move in a weird way? And we see that no, it did not. Another strike against the UFO weirdos, I say. Chat. I find the study of gravity so attractive. <laughs> Does annihilation only happen with some kind of the same kind of matter, antimatter, for example, just hydrogen and antihydrogen, or would it also happen with hydrogen anti helium? I don't know. Actually, I've always assumed they were the same particles. People are still talking about a Tim Pool roast. Cool. Ooh. Oh, I can finally see all, all of your super chat messages. Holy crap. 599, first time live. Hail the Kyle. Thank you so much. What about your quantum superconductors? Does that count as anti-gravity? When we talk about th this was this is like a true test of true anti-gravity. Like a material, not a material, but matter itself just being matter acting against a gravitational field. And we're talking about quantum superconductors, quantum superconductivity, that is levitation via opposing magnetic fields. That's it. Archer with the 10 asking the same question. If a particle an annihilates with an antiparticle, it's not its own counterpart. What happens to the mass asymmetry? I literally don't know. I've never asked the question. So we've proven that antimatter exists. Yes, we've known about antimatter for a long time. Um, and like I said, the promise of antimatter is really cool. If we could make enough of it, then it would be the most energy dense fuel that there is. Now, this is backwards for you, but I don't care. Um, in terms of energy density, you can go up a different, a couple different levels. If we start with something like oil, 150 barrels of oil is equal to one ton of coal. which is equal to 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. Different en energy densities, getting more energy dense as we go up. So 17,000 natural gas, not as energy dense as coal, not as energy dense as oil. Well, they're, you know, they're close to the same thing. But one pellet of uranium is the same as all of these. One, the, the energy that you can get from nuclear fission from one pellet, just this one pellet, is the same as one ton of coal. And the energy you can get out of this amount of antimatter is substantially higher. In fact, whoop, whoop, whoop. In fact, chat, since we finished a little early, why don't we just look at it? <laughs> How do we extract the energy from antimatter? Says J, JG, 
um, extracting the energy from antimatter would be the exact same thing we did for we do for everything else. Um, we would capture the heat energy from the annihilation, and we would turn that heat into steam, and those steam and those steam would turn turbines and create electricity. That's it. Nothing more complicated than that. Chat, all, all nuclear energy is, is using spicy rocks to make hot air. That's it. Use it to boil water, but how? Well, say you have an antimatter annihilation chamber. The chamber's walls themselves can handle the annihilation events, and they're just some sort of conductive metal that gets hot. And on the other side of that containment chamber, you have it cooled with water, and you just siphon off the water. You want that as a shirt? Chat, my, uh... Wolfram Alpha isn't loading. So I can go somewhere else. Okay. So... Let's check this out. So chat, this is, um... Atomic Rockets, the nerdiest website ever created by man. And this is called The Boom Table. And in this, nerds like myself have accumulated energy equivalents for different things. Now, one thing that I always like to point out is just how crazy antimatter is. So just here, <laughs> just here, one microgram of antimatter, one millionth of a gram so you wouldn't even be able to feel this on your finger one microgram of antimatter has the same energy comp content that could vaporize your entire body that is effectively how much energy is in a lightsaber let's go to one milligram now we're into project thor territories let's go to one Let's go to one gram of antimatter. That's more than Hiroshima and Nagasaki's bombs. One gram. One gram. Like this. Whoa. Whoa. What's going on? Like this, like the weight of maybe the top of, let's say, theoretically a white claw. That amount would destroy a city. Let's keep going. Por qué not matter? Por qué no los dos? One kilogram and you have Sarbamba. One kilogram, 2.2 .2 pounds, and you have Sarbamba. So you quickly see how things get out of, out of control, right? What's happening? What'd you do? Things get very, very quickly out of control. That's actually crazy. Yeah, so, and you keep going uh, let's keep going. Where's the next one? Photon torpedo. One kilogram of matter is an 8.5 earthquake. One metric ton. You're into... <laughs> asteroid impact. That would destroy all life on Earth. So, pretty serious stuff, chat. That's how... It's the most theoretically efficient. Turning matter directly into energy. But where are all the antimatter galaxies, says Estrin. Estrin, it is an open question. Why, when the universe was created, there ended up being more matter than antimatter in it? We don't know. We actually don't know. Did anyone uh, look up my question? I don't know... Um, I don't know if a antiparticles only annihilate with their partners. I don't know. But um, speaking of proton torpedoes, Chad, something else that um, Atomic Rockets pointed out to me when I first started researching these things a long time ago is that something like an antimatter bomb wouldn't be as easy to blow something up with as you think. Um, because let's say you had a sphere of antimatter. The, the nanosecond the, the front edge of that sphere touches your target, anything. The surface here, the surface interaction is gonna annihilate and blow away the rest of your material that you wanna use. So 
maybe instead of a spherical warhead, you instead want like a hemispherical warhead to in, to uh, increase the amount of surface area during the detonation. So you actually get the most bang for your buck buck. So what part of anti-gravity was ruled out, says Dustin Brandle, the part where um, it's possible mediation by um, antimatter. Could you use it up to blow a planet? Could you use it to blow a planet up? Yes. But you could blow a planet up just with a fast rock. You know? Why is annihilation so volatile and energetic? Mass directly into energy. Annihilation has to be equal particles, so H has to annihilate with H, etc. This comes from momentum conservation, to sum it up. Thank you, Alex R., for pointing that out. That's what I thought, but I didn't know exactly why. Love the why, way Kyle thinks about the kinematics of annihilation reactions. Well, who else is going to do it? Chat, who else is going to do it? Chat, who else is going to do it? Chat, who else is going to do it? Chad, who else is going to do it? The Dude, Chance, The Rapper, Tyler, The Creator, Megan, The Stallion. Am I right? <laughs> God, I'm good. Lagos. First line, is that not? Chat. Man, I'm good. I did that, you know, while you were talking. Which hot rock is your favorite? I do have uranium in the facility, and I am going to use it. Speaking of speaking, of which chat, um, since we're still here. Oh, my God. Um, since we're still here coming up at the facility, we've been held up on a couple of videos um, and I've been meaning to get them out. But uh, suffice to say, October might be a little bit spicier month. Um, then usual coming up next will be uh, another spacey physics -y episode tangential to Starfield. After that, we have my video from a trip to a working nuclear power plant where I got to touch nuclear waste, literally. Um, maybe at the very tail end of the month, we have a one punch man analysis episode. I know you weebs love that. And then I just finished writing um, the second episode from our Expedition Fukushima series. And of course, in between all that, when I can, we have more Half-Life histories. What plant did you visit? Uh, says I am Koopa. I visited the Dresden Generating Station, station in Illinois. Um, so a lot of a lot of fun, sciencey, nuclear -y episodes coming out soon. I know we've been backed up, but that's that's not on me. It's on foreign advertisers. What? Exactly. Yeah, of course, antimatter exists. We can generate it now. That's how the whole experiment that we we talked about works. Um, Kyle, can you quickly explain how white phosphorus works? Uh. I don't know. It burns without needing the uh, 
the fuel from the air so it can burn by itself. It has its own fuel. And so it's very, very hard to put out because usually you put out a fire by smothering it, which means it can't get oxygen. But if it doesn't need oxygen or the oxygen's already inside of the fuel, it has its own oxidizer, then it's gonna continue to burn like inside of somebody's body, which is why it's banned, I think. Uh, any game streams coming up? Uh, yeah, I think we'll do some more cyberpunk this weekend. Mr. Killer, fresh, Mr. Killer. Thank you for the nice words. Um, it has its own oxygen and fuel. Yeah, see, there you go. There you go, Chad. See, what I love about learning about sciencey things is once you know the fundamentals of how things work, you can apply those fundamentals to get better conceptual understandings of a lot of different things. I didn't know exactly how white phosphorus worked, but I knew it can burn even in someone's body or even underwater. Why? Well, it needs fuel, so the fuel must be internal. I know some things have their own oxidizers in them, some bullets and stuff like that, so I thought, well, maybe that has the same thing. And so I took a shot and I'm correct. Debbie, welcome. Pong is monkey? This is Dylan? Yes. How do I identify antimatter at a distance in a vacuum without seeing it annihilate? You you trap it, you trap it, and then you test it. You trap it. You find what reactions it comes out of. You trap it, you gather it, and then you annihilate it. How does one contain an antimatter annihilation consistently to be used as thrust as Sin's Arcade? Just use a little bit of it. Imagine magnetically firing just a few dozen atoms or at, you know, a few hundred, whatever it is, I'd have to do the math, but just a few, so you have a, you have a magnetic accelerator, you know, that has these antiparticles trapped and you have the partner particles inside of a reaction chamber and you just fire them at a sufficient rate, magnetically, at the target, the target continuously annihilates because there's more material here, and you capture the annihilation energy, the heat energy, and you use that to do whatever you're gonna do with the thing. Um, that would be more for a reactor. For a spaceship, you would have that reaction just blast out the back. You direct the energy release this way so that you go, that away. Chad, all rocket science is, is figuring out how to make this do that. That's it. Move stuff quickly in the direction opposite you want to go. That's it. Would something like an antimatter power plant even exist or would it be too difficult? Now that would be... When people are afraid of nuclear power, um, and I've, of course I'll do, I have many videos on this and there'll be more videos on this. I just wrote the Fukushima part two episode is a lot about nuclear meltdowns. Um, but if people are afraid about, afraid of a nuclear meltdown, think of what would happen if you lost containment on some amount of antimatter and the whole city blows up. Now I'm sure that there's, I'm positive you could think of a, a safer way to do it and store it and all that kind of stuff, but antimatter is volatile in a way that nuclear fuel is not. I know Kyle is half Aussie. Give me a best Aussie accent, says random FPV. I'm not half, I thought up of, um, I thought of a new term for myself. More of like a Chris Hemsworthless. Yeah, and also you'd want it to be economically viable, which right now the generation of antimatter is not economically viable at all. I'm confused. Don't aliens have anti-gravity drives? No. Um, you don't need anti-gravity drives when you're in space. Um, yeah. You should debunk the the fears people have about nuclear, says Rob Fur. Rob, I have great news. Go back into the main channel, check out our Half-Life History series, check out our um, Expedition, Expedition Fukushima and Expedition Chernobyl videos if you want. I've, 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 I've done a lot, um, but also the nuclear waste episode coming out later this month where I'm literally 
at a nuclear power plant with engineers, armed guards looking at me, a PR team, and I talk about nuclear waste as it actually exists in the world. Kyle Hilda's Science Thrill. Ooh! Adventures in the Dark with the two, thank you. Could you make a rail gun with antimatter? Well, you wouldn't need the rail part anymore. That's just a gun. Railgun uses the uh, 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 sequenced electromagnetic forces to move a conductive um, piece of metal. Projectile, Jesus. With antimatter, you just, you use it like uh, black powder or whatever. You just touch the antimatter to the back of the thing. And just, well, it wouldn't do this. It would do this. Have to be accurate. Cosmic Callness with the 2,000 w double Ws. Much love and respect, mister. Thank you so much. Uh, Senior Meets with the 999. I support nuclear energy, but uh, antimatter, although exciting, may be too dangerous to try to use as an energy source until we can settle other planets, just in case something does go wrong. I agree. I agree. Antimatter is, is that's, that's what I always say, like, there's nothing inherent about a uranium fuel pellet that is, you know, civilization threatening. You have to, in a nuclear power plant, you have to arrange a bunch of radioactive material in a very specific way to make it do anything. Antimatter, if it touches something, everything explodes. Uh, thank you, Archer, for the kind words. Yeah, the the we had a really good time at the. Um, it was over a hundred degrees inside of the nuclear power plant because it was in the middle of July, in the Midwest. So it was really freaking hot. But I got to see Cherenkov radiation with my own eyes. The Fukushima video you did was a bombshell for me, and I consider myself pretty darn literate. I try my best. Um. But yeah, I got to see Cherenkov radiation with my own eyes up close. Really cool. And guess what? Inside of a nuclear facility, right next to a spent nuclear fuel pool, where you can see the blue glow from real nuclear waste, which is just fuel rods. Just, just the, literally, just these pellets in a tube. That's it. That's what nuclear fuel is. It's just, it's just that. Um, the radiate, the ambient level of radiation in the room was about what you'd get, um, flying on an airplane. Unless you really knew your stuff, I don't think most people would, th most people I think would think it would be way higher. Like you're standing next to a pool of glowing fuel. How hot is it in there? I was more worried about the temperature, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. I was, I was sweating from my forearms, which I've never done before. It was dripping from my forearm. That was weird. What is the best way to engage young people in science? I'm tutoring my 15-year-old niece in maths and science for her exams, and she gets it, but she clearly isn't really engaged by it. You know, it's a slay -a wolf. Speak their language. Know your audience. Come up with topics and um, lessons or examples that fit within the person's knowledge base and their language and their visual language. It's, it's, that's, that's why a show like Because Science Worked is because I'm talking about quantum physics, but I'm also using it to explain Ant-Man. It's something you're already interested in. Um, Randall Monroe of XKCD, his big breakthrough in terms of his science communication was when he was teaching, he was substituting a physics class at MIT, and the kids didn't get interested until he started talking about like, okay, well, we're talking about forces. Uh, how much energy would it take for Yoda to lift the X-Wing out of the Dagobin Swamp? And yes, it is a very nerdy example, but it's a more interesting example to the nerdy kids who are in the room. Right. So if you're if you're tutoring your 15 year old niece, I would ask her what her interests are, what she really wants to learn about, what kind of shows that she likes. Just just 
or, or ask her her parents or, or parent. And then, I mean, you can't make everything fit, but but try to be more aware of what they are interested in, not just. You can't expect anyone to really love pure math and science. I'll be the first to tell you, it's pretty damn dry. It's in molding it and shaping it and linking it conceptually to other things that you really like that it becomes fun and interesting, right? Like the classic question is like, why is the sky blue? I could tell you about R Raleigh's, Rayleigh, Raleigh, I? Raleigh scattering and wavelengths and all that kind of stuff. What's boring without application, without interest, right? Thank you for educating us. It's my job. Like, I, I only do, I do this because I believe I'm good at it. And if I'm not, and, and therefore I'm morally obligated to do it. Also, Kevin has a gun to my head. Yeah, I'll talk. Yeah, I'm talking about physics. I like astronomy because of Sailor Moon, says Aaliyah. Yeah, totally fair. I was once in a room, I think it was JPL or something like that. Yeah, it must have been JPL. Someone on stage said like, who here is working at NASA because they loved Star Trek as a kid? And almost everyone raised their hand. It's about combining, it's finding someone's intersection between what they want to know and what they already like. Write that one down. Yeah, we'll put it in the book. Yeah. I don't know, like a, I'll be, not a pamphlet? 50 pages? I don't know. Uh, gotta be the one to poke you for more occasional rock climbing content. It's physics, it's Tony B. I'm a big rock climber. I'm getting back into it. I'm getting strong again after multiple injuries. Now, uh, flashing some V7s again at the gym. Oh. So getting pretty strong again, which is good. Um, but yeah, I'll do more climbing videos when I think of them. Actually, I, I mentioned, I made sure to point out to my agents that it's like, if, there, if there's any climbing related integrations that come along, hook me up. I can still do like the physics of friction on your fingertips and on your shoes. That's a great idea. Kevin, write that down. Get, don't point the barrel at my face. Don't point a gun at anything you don't want to destroy. He doesn't, he has, he does, he's got no trigger discipline. He's, ugh. When's your next Magic the Gathering video? Says Sins Arcade. Uh, the next appearance I'm making, I believe will be in a commander game with the professor and get this, Tier Zoo. That will be on the professor's channel. Um, but also, if you want to play Magic the Gathering with me in person, uh, you can still get tickets to the Magic the Gathering Summit in Salt Lake City in, in about two weeks. I'll be playing with people for literally a total amount of like 36 hours of games. Yes, yes, anti-gravity. But will this research involve our Thank you, Shock Tay with the five. By the way, doing pull-ups wearing Goku's stuff is badass. That was 80 pounds of steel I did a pull-up in. Not recommended. That could really mess you up. I just want to get back to one-arm pull-up strength, but I'm too heavy. When I was super, super light and super, super strong, I won't tell you how light I was, because who cares? Um, but I was very light, and I could do one-arm pull-ups with each arm. That's where I want to get back to, but I'm too big now. I'm too... I'm too beefy. Kyle, can you put money on Magic the Gathering? I mean, technically, you can put money on anything. So, Winter Rain with the Australian $2. It says, get I. Well, I didn't say get I. He said, hello, but I'll say get I. Do you like the upcoming Doctor Who cards for Magic? No. I don't like Doctor Who. Kyle's an absolute beast at these events and will play with anyone. Highly recommend a game with him, says Sack I I don't pull any punches. No punches are pulled. There's no holds that will be barred. Get in it before you hit 40. I'm trying my best. Why don't freight ships run on nuclear? I don't know. 
probably, I mean, we have nuclear submarines and all that stuff. It's probably cost. What about the Fallout cards? Says Jared Robinson. I'm so hyped for Fallout magic. Woo! Chat, I can't, I do have some insider information about the Fallout Magic the Gathering crossover. I can't tell you. But I will say that I, in particular, will be interested in some of the mechanics for flavor reasons. They will very much vibe with what we do. You look like Thor without the hammer. Don't make me get the hammer. Wes Wolf, Wes Wolf thank you for the 1999. <laughs> that was a howl just for you, Wes Wolf, because I saw in your avatar right there that uh, you are follically inclined. How is antimatter made as um, the product of particle accelerator smashings? Chad, I know this is usually the amount of time we do office hours, but you know, since I haven't done it in a little while and we're enjoying ourselves, I figure we can we can talk a little, about a little bit more. I already showed you my connection skills, of course. Um, we also have a gameplay channel if you do like watching the only science and gameplay streams on the internet. It's Kyle Hill Gaming. Science everything from Sekiro to Cyberpunk. Have you ever played Titanfall 2? Yes, it's one of the best first-person shooters ever made and one of the best first-person shooter campaigns I've ever played. I do have a screen accurate 20 pound Thor's hammer in the facility. Uh, it was made and given to me by the Hacksmith and it's hanging next to my, uh, my uh, Leviathan axe. Yeah, no, it's fine if we don't like it. it if we don't like the same things, it's fine. What I, I made this point in the gaming streams a little while ago, but like, if I don't like Doctor Who, if it's not for me, I, I, I won't say the thing is bad. You know, like that separates a good review from a bad review in, in my mind. Um, we're like, I don't like Doctor West Wolf with another 1999. Yeah, I know you like that howl, didn't you? Um, you know, I would never, you know, Cyberpunk is trash. Doctor Who's trash. I don't like it. No, I mean, they're objectively not trash. If they were trash, they wouldn't. Doctor Who wouldn't have been on for 50 years or whatever it is. Um, same with Baldur's Gate. I'm not a I'm not a D&D guy, but I recognize that the game is a fantastically well made game. You know. I'm a magic guy. I, 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 I can't get it. I've, I have too much money in magic. I can't get into Dungeons and Dragons now. Also, I don't like gathering with people, so I guess I'm a walking contradiction. Um, how does Halo 3 rank in your top campaigns? It's pretty much up there. Um, we, I feel like we always end with a question like this, Chet, but in terms of narrative gameplay experiences, it's The Last of Us 1 and 2, Red Dead Redemption 2, and then probably God of War 2, or God of War 1 and 2, the new ones. Those are, I mean, in terms of writing, acting, and execution, I mean, uh, how do you get better than that? It's literally called Magic the Gathering, though, Kyle. Yes, but now we can play online, and also with people that I know. But Kyle, didn't you just say you're going to a convention for an entire weekend just to play with people? Stop contradicting me. It's rude. I'll also be playing in a Magic the Gathering tournament with Dr. Lupo streaming soon, chat. Diamond Go with the 499, he says, Hey, you know in anime how they stomp the ground, the ground around them shatters, given the force is spread. How much force would be needed to do that? First of all, you sound like a good time. Second of all, I don't know. Depends on the ground. Um, depends what the ground's made of. Uh, not, no, God of War, the Norse ones, not the OG ones. Um, yeah, depends on the ground. Are you playing Tarkov with Lupo? No, I, I, I don't play Tarkov anymore. I smashed a hole in my desk and I almost broke my hand. Are you, gonna, are you playing a character when you go on magic shows on YouTube? Uh, no, that's me. I'm more of a character on my shows. 
I'm still me, of course, but it's it's more, you know, Hill Kai, the science guy. You know, when I play Magic, I'm pretty spicy. You know, I'm a spicy. I I, I love winning. But it's just you and me here, chat. Do you think antimatter reactors will be possible? Not anywhere in the time of my life. <laughs> Almost didn't make it through that one. But it's it's I mean, the 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 main problem is production and containment right now, like. Uh, no, I'm never in character. I'm just I have different gears. You know, like I said about about knowing your audience, right? Talking to you and trying to tell you about the intricacies of an antimatter experiment is a very different way of communicating than if I'm sitting at a table with someone that I want to beat in a card game. You know what I mean? Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, so antimatter production right now is is we can produce it, but it's so we can produce so few, uh, the quantity is so small and it's so hard to get that quantity that the economics of it is totally backwards. How do you get just such a silky smooth mane, argan oil? I know I've been meaning to do eventually uh, uh, a hair care routine in some form, in some sort of content. Why the low viewers? Because no, because I fell off. And we're no longer talking about the antimatter experiment. That, ooh, wow, that is low. Damn. Anyway, Chad. Um, coming up the facility, like I said, this weekend we'll probably be doing some more um, cyberpunky streams, cyberpunky Brewster, and we'll be explaining the science there. If you haven't watched our latest episode at the facility about aliens, go and check that out. Previously, before that, we still have an ongoing fundraiser for the dogs of Chernobyl. I think we're at $26,000 there, which brings our total almost up to $100,000 total. They just went there. In, in fact, I, I just got sent a picture. Uh, I just got to send a picture. Look at that. Look, you tell me you don't want to support them pups. Look at those good little boys. Go check that out. And of course, if you want to continue on this conversation after we're live, the best place to do so is patreon.com slash Kyle Hill, where you get access to the private discord among many other benefits where you can ping me at any time of day, especially around 1 or 2 p.m. Thanks, Europe. I hope to see you there and you can get discounts on merch. I have some, I just got some more, uh, cause I want to, I just got some new hard drives in the facility. I want to stick some stickers on them. Hell yeah. Look at that. Look at that holographic. This is not a place of honor sticker. <laughs> Gonna be slapping this bad boy. This bad boy can fit so much radiation in it. Look at these. Oh, look how metal that is. Yeah. Anyway, that's shop.kylehill.net. Chat, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Starting your week on, starting your weekend off strong. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. To all of you inside the facility, I will see you right after these doors close. And remember to everyone, be nice to each other because this is all we got. Take care. Kevin, why are the numbers so low? Why is the top, what's up, man?